very much. Um, I'm the president for the International Association of University, and I'm very happy to uh, open this uh, webinar. It's a joint webinar where we are launching a global conversation on women in leadership in higher education. And the specific topics today, the gender sensitive institute structures and policies. And uh, we will come to good actions, I hope, at the end. Uh, we are three uh, organizers and two from regions, Europe and Africa, and IAU as the global uh, representatives. And very brief, IAU is the global network of higher education institutions and associations. And we partner with many national, international, and intergovernmental uh, partners. And that includes UNESCO, who was also the uh, inauguration uh, or inaugurated the IAU 1950. We do have priorities in leadership, in uh, internationalization, in higher education for sustainable development and technology. And I would say that all these priorities have gender perspectives and we have to look at gender perspectives in all of them. And we do so through uh, sharing expertise, uh, trends analysis, uh, advices, and not at least publication. And I will refer to some of them uh, later on, but you can find them on the uh, webpage of ISU. So for this opening, I once again would like to say that I'm, I'm very pleased that we three organizations now partners for actually strengthening and also developing our gender perspective and gender equality in higher education and not at least in leadership. So welcome everyone. Kulzun. You're muted. Olson, we cannot hear you. Am I the second speaker? Because I thought that I'm the third one. It's with, no, it was supposed to be Lucy. So yeah, it's oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We should Thank have you. Lucy. We should have Lucy first now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Lucy Heddy, and I am the CEO of Education Sub-Saharan Africa, or ESSA. ESSA is a small NGO with a majority African team based in Africa and the UK, working to connect data and evidence on education from Africa with those who have the power to improve the system. And that includes educators, policymakers, and young people themselves. Our vision is one of high quality education in Sub-Saharan Africa that allows young people to fulfill their ambitions and strengthen society. And our mission starts with universities and colleges using data and evidence to drive a dramatic improvement in outcomes for young people. We work across the student journey, looking at issues of access, quality and transition to work. And we also support researchers working on education, leveraging the power of Africa's universities and colleges to improve outcomes for young people at all levels of education. Now, one of the biggest challenges with working to improve tertiary education is ensuring that those improvements are felt by everyone, no matter their background or critically their gender. Time and again, we have seen how problems in the system are amplified for women, from financing their studies to being supported through to successful careers. Brilliant organizations such as Farway, Award, Mawazo Institute and Rue Forum are doing, and many others are doing tremendous work to break the bias and change how women experience tertiary education. Um, however, such organizations are often forced to work in the dark due to the lack of data available on women's experiences. And so it's been an extraordinary privilege to work alongside some of these organizations to establish the baseline for female leadership in African tertiary education institutions and collecting data and evidence to help them advocate for, implement and scale up their programs. Um, thank you to the IAU and Awara for your partnership in co-hosting this event today and raising the profile of such a critical topic. And thank you for everyone joining here today. I really hope that you enjoy the presentations and that the evidence you see discussed here today inspires further action and collaboration. Thanks so much.
Okay. May I start, PG? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I explained at the beginning that I'm the president of Evora. Evora is a, a European uh, Women Directors Association established in uh, 2015. And uh, in fact, our initiative started in 2009 as a platform, but uh, we converted it into an association in 2015, established in Brussels. So we have uh, over 100 members, uh, women leaders from uh, universities, uh, basically from European universities. And now I would like to turn to my uh, short uh, contribution. Dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for Evora to organize this second webinar for celebrating International Women's Day 2022 in collaboration with International Association of Universities and ESSA, titled as Women in Leadership in Higher Education, Global and Regional Perspectives. Before I share my, I share my thoughts with you on the subject area, I would like to express our deep concern about the Ukraine invasion by Russia, which is not only creating threat for Ukraine, but also creating serious risk for the peace across the world. We do hope that in the nearest future, the peace will be achieved between Ukraine and Russia without sacrificing the rights of Ukrainian people. Dear colleagues, gender equality is one of the fundamental principles of European Union and EU has been promoting it as a core activity since 1957 with EU treaties, Treaty of Rome 1957, Treaty of Amsterdam 1997, Treaty of Lisbon 2007-2009 and the measures to increase the women representation in all segments of higher education and research have been extended and implemented since then by the framework programs throughout the years. All of these efforts bringing the obligation to eliminate inequalities and ensuring promoting equality between men and women also introduces gender equality as a determining factor for potential candidates for the accession to the EU. Unfortunately, improvements is achieving gender balance in higher education and research areas have been slow, unfortunately very slow. I would like to share just three figures uh, from the She Figures 2021 released on 24th of November, 2021. If you look at the A-grade positions ratios, in 2018, she figures, it was 24%. It went up to 26.2% in the she figures 2021. The situation is even worse in the engineering and technology area. A-grade positions in engineering and technology areas in 2018, it was 15% and it went up to 17.9% in 2021. If we look at the women heads of institutions ratio, it was 20% in the year 2015. And now in the 2021 she figures, it went up to 23.6%. So we can see that there are improvements, but they are really very slow. Although European Commission has been, has been taking serious steps since 1957. Unfortunately, improvements have not been able to realize our dreams of having equal representations at all levels. Now Horizon Europe is taking further steps to implement new requirements for funding applications of European Commission funded uh, programs called as gender equality strengthen cross-cutting priority in Horizon Europe. It has three levels. First one, gender equality plans. This is an eligibility criteria for uh, applying funding. Integration of uh, gender dimension in research and innovation content. This was the second one. And the third one is gender balance in 
research teams. This is a ranking criterion. I do hope that gender equality plans will be successful to achieve gender balance at all levels of higher education and research in our universities in the years to come. Dear colleagues, I think as women academic leaders, we should be the most supportive group to do our best to increase the ratio of women professors in our universities to, to pave the way to make them able to reach the leading positions in our universities and in the higher education and research systems of our countries. There, there is an old saying in Turkish, maybe similar old saying exists in all languages. In order to be a master, you have to be better than your master. And also you have to educate and tra train new masters who are better than you. This should be our main goal to support and encourage our women professors to make them able to reach leadership positions, not only occupying the positions, but taking serious steps towards achieving gender balance in every aspect of university functions and actions to create better conditions for all young women academics. I would like to congratulate, celebrate all of us for the International uh, Women's Day. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Gulsun. Um, I would like to maybe turn then to Pam. Would you like to speak on behalf of the IEU and then Lucy on be behalf of ESSA, add a bit on uh, how to how would you set the scene for this conversation today? Would you like to add um, just a little? And then we will give the floor to Carmen Fenol. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, good. Um. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would start with the global perspective uh, from IAU. And uh, I have just been in a meeting in Sweden. I can say that the, per, the, um, the hindrances for women is similar all over the world. All, although we have socioeconomic, cultural, and, and economic uh, in general, uh, different uh, perspectives and also prerequisites, I would say that there are very, very similar hindrances for women to take uh, leadership in higher education. And the COVID has also shown the shortcomings. And let us take the shortcomings shown in uh, the uh, experience from COVID to be also guiding us for the future because it's highlighting really what the hindrances are. So what I will do is uh, I look into uh, the global figures and uh, International Association of University has the only global database on higher education institutions in the world. It's called the WED database and it's uh, having all the authorized uh, uh, higher education institutions all around the world. So almost uh, a little bit more, I would say today than 20,000 institutions are in this uh, database. It's also uh, ID numbers on each of the institutions uh, in that database. And it collects uh, 196 countries. So I would say that that's all over the world. And this database is of course, very, very important information uh, to get knowledge about higher education institutions and leaderships, but also to reach out. And UN has used that database to reach out to all the higher education institutions around the world. And what do we find? We find the national uh, higher education structures, uh, quality assurance in the institutions. And I would say that gender would be, should be a part of that. Uh, governing bodies and also credential and admissions that you can get. So for women leadership, going into this database and see what it is. Uh, Gulson, you had the SHE report, but looking into the database globally, we can say that uh, out of the higher education institutions, there are more than 20,000, 17% on a global perspective are women. In Europe, we find that around 20% of the rectors or, or vice chancellors uh, are women. And in Africa, just 7% of the rectors are women. 
So I think those figures speaks for themselves, but also we have to see that there are, of course, diversity within this different regions and where we look. So we have to look behind what is giving in those figures. Leadership, uh, now we talk about leadership uh, on the rector's reference. In my point of view, leadership on all levels, from research leader to, to the leading the educational programs, all parts of leadership is very important because that brings the women also up to the top leadership in the future. So we have to see already from the schools that we have a gender balance. We have to see that the students at the universities and the staff at the universities have a gender balance. And we have to see that gender balance is a quality in what, all what we do. And I think that you also brought forward, Kulsan, that what we do in the higher education institutions, that will also be reflected in the society at large. So what is behind those figures? I would also like to highlight the um, global clusters that I has uh, started uh, 2018. Uh, higher education for sustainable development has been part of the priorities for, for uh, IAU uh, since the 90s. And uh, we started 2018 clusters on uh, one champion university for each of the SDGs and SDG five is Bologna University. And they have recently published a paper together with the IAU uh, looking into good examples. How could you do to promote uh, gender equality and that are perspectives from all over the world. So I really encourage you to read those because I think what we need is, is good practices. What, what is working and, and uh, also to take that um, into your own institution and your own perspectives in your own country. So uh, the aim of the uh, cluster is actually to create network for synergies and capacity to act. And that is important. Also to provide evidence to policy and decision makers. And you brought up, Lucy, the importance of having data. So uh, I would say that um, leadership actions and support in all activities, what we are doing in the universities is very important to inspire and also to promote young women. And of course, I think that you, Lucy, will bring up the different, uh, what do you say, behind the scene, what is, what is the real hindrance? And those are the things we have to tackle. And we also have to, to make awareness to policymakers and to governments about what's going on. I don't see the higher education institutions themselves can do all of it. We need to get the civil society with us. We need to get the politicians and government with us to do this. And I think it, it's urgent. We have seen those figures for a long time and we might go uh, backwards if we don't do anything after the COVID situation. And I'm again, very happy that we have this discussion and I hope that the panel also will look forward what to do and how could we share experience. So that's my setting scene. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going around the world and I would like to give the floor to Lucy Hedy to also then give the floor to your colleagues probably to set the scene for Africa. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Hilliger. So I'm going to hand directly over to um, Jennifer Ude, who has been leading um, our research on female leadership in higher education in Africa, um, and our colleague Krista, who has been helping to um, undertake this research as well. So over to you, Jennifer. Thanks very much, um, Lucy and, and everybody here today. So, so really, Essa's, Essa's work around women leading started um, as a result of some work we did in 2018. We conducted research and analysis in partnership with the African Association of Universities, the Population Reference Bureau, and the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, formerly NCTE. Um, which revealed that only 8% of professors at public universities in Ghana were women. Um, we had further discussions with faculty members in sub-Saharan Africa and, and really highlighted the lack of evidence about the role of universities and colleges in sub-Saharan Africa in equipping women for leadership opportunities. So therefore we initiated a women, 
we initiated the Women Leading Initiative and that aims to unlock the potential of female leaders in education in Sub-Saharan Africa. The focus really is on increasing the number of women in leadership positions within universities and colleges, but also supporting female students to develop leadership skills for their careers beyond university. And our State of Women Leading report is the first output of our Women Leading initiative. It really captures the insights from existing research and the current perspectives of women in Africa who are at different stages of their leadership journey. We will be circulating the full report um, during and following this webinar, but to contribute this afternoon to setting the scene, uh, my colleague Krista and I will be highlighting some of the key findings and the conclusions of the study, and which really focus on the barriers that we identified, the critical skills for leadership and the focus areas for further action. Krista. Thank you, Jennifer. So the results presented in our report were largely based on a survey that was rolled out between November 2020 and February 2021. So within this survey, there was an analysis of responses from over 400 female faculty, students, and early career graduates. In addition to the online survey we rolled out, we also conducted interviews with female leaders across Sub-Saharan Africa. And then finally, there was also a literature analysis of female leadership in Africa which included literature from policy-making bodies, business, media, and academia. Okay, so thank you, Jennifer. So within our research, we're able to identify some of the key barriers to female leadership developments in these different institutions that we were looking at. So the top four were social cultural expectations, limited access to mentorship opportunities, and limited networking opportunities. And then finally, unconscious workplace bias. So for social cultural expectations, as many of us will probably know, in most parts of Africa, taking care of the home is still kind of seen as being the primary role for women. So a lot of women are raised with that view. So having that in mind, a lot of them often lack the confidence to lead. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as such, they're less likely to even seek leadership positions, which would then go against what society's trad traditional views of them are. For the second one being the mentorship opportunities, from our research, we, we realized that women typically do have access to mentors for guidance, but then they lack the adequate sponsors who can advocate for their promotion, who can advocate to, who can introduce them to key stakeholders and who can actually just give them exposure to senior roles. For the networking as well, with the kind of networks that are existing right now, we realize that they are the proverbial old boy networks, which automatically exclude women. So they are not able to access some of this inside information. They're not able to access these social networks, which the members typically have. And then finally, for the workplace bias as well, <clears throat> excuse me, most tertiary institutions across Sub-Saharan Africa are predominantly male. And as such, gender issues are often not really seen as a priority, which makes it difficult for women to even break into some of these leadership positions. Through our research, we asked the women we interviewed what they thought the most important skills for leadership were. And they identified these top five conceptual skills, which emerged as the most important, which is basically critical thinking, decision-making, analytical abilities, and logical reasoning. And then following conceptual skills were the human skills and leadership ethics and value skills, which are largely integrity, trust, empathy, emotional intelligence, and social integration and networking. One of the final questions that we asked during the survey was what the participants felt were the most important further actions that could take that would have the biggest impact on female leadership development in Africa. And our research really pointed to four key areas um, that would support leadership development for women. These are scholarships, leadership training and development programs, gender sensitive organizational structures and policies and networking opportunities. For scholarships, it was really felt that scholarships would and have encouraged and motivated many women to take up leadership positions, really enabling them to take up these positions. It was felt that leadership training and development um, potentially had to really sig could significantly contribute to the development of soft skills and the mindset of women. Um, and gender sensitive organizational structures really pointing to the need to have supportive and inclusive environments within institutions. Here really speaking of the recruitment, the promotion and appointment processes 
um, within institutions, um, lacking transparency and being susceptible to um, gender bias. And finally, um, in universities and colleges, really met, net, networking, mentoring, role modeling, sponsorship, all of these areas were really viewed as powerful interventions that could really assist and support and guide um, young ac academics, especially females, as they develop into and women leaders in education. So really our, our work contributes insights from women in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it really provides guidance on where further research, evidence and action is needed to unlock the potential of women leaders um, in education. And our work shows that there's still significant underrepresentation of women in leadership positions across sub-Saharan Africa, specifically from our survey, 46% of the women surveyed said that they were dissatisfied with their current levels of leadership. And while we recognise that our findings can't be taken as fully representative of all women in sub-Saharan Africa, it does support a knowing that more can be done and more should be done to support female leadership development. And also importantly, it's not just about the number of women in leadership positions. Our research also highlighted that it's also important to consider what types of support is required to sustain women that are already in leadership positions as well. We have the four main areas that we've identified. Uh, at ESSA, we've already begun to discuss these areas in more detail with stakeholders in sub-Saharan Africa to dig deeper into these areas and co-create solutions which can be implemented. And so really today we're looking forward to the global conversation this afternoon, um, really specifically on one of those areas, gender sensitive organizational structures and policies. We will really welcome and encourage you all to share your perspectives, your ideas as we dig deeper into this topic um, in the discussions shortly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer and, and Chris as well for this, uh, for all these uh, very good presentations. I would like to give the floor now to Carmen Fenol to also set the stage for Europe. Uh, and then we will have a poll question. So stay tuned for that. And then we will move into a panel debate with uh, a series of questions uh, that will be facilitated by Professor Mwenda and Tarangui. Um, from the Commission for University Education in Nairobi. So we first give the floor to you, Carmen. Excuse me, I was silenced and I launched the the presentation without turning my Mic microphone on. on. Okay. okay, can you see now the screen? Yes. Very good. Okay, I was um, asked uh, by uh, the president of Evora to prepare a very short um, abstract about the situation of uh, research and the position of uh, women in research, both in Europe and in Spain. And I have organized a very, very brief presentation in three parts, a little bit about chief figures, um, a little bit about gender in the European research area. And then I will tell you uh, just a, a glimpse of what we are doing in Spain and how we are there. Um, so about um, chief figures, this last edition has some examples and good practice from institutions and countries. This is very good and very useful. And it has also introduced several new indicators. Uh, among them are things like uh, the share of, uh, of women in research, uh, employment in the private sector, which we didn't know about before, and look at the numbers, how different they are from public institutions. Also, the precarious and part-time position by career stay and family status, which is, of course, higher in women, particularly in early stages and with children. The mobility of junior researchers is similar for men and women, but not for senior researchers. Senior men move much more than we do. And uh, there are more and more uh, research organizations with gender plans, at least in their websites. And there are interesting data in authorship, like a senior women 
published increasingly less that men. And this is particularly um, um, evident in STEM fields. And uh, there is an increasing uh, accounting for gender perspectives in research content. And about funding, I just want to share with you some data that I think are very, uh, I don't know, they set, uh, they set the floor for, for discussion. Uh, you have here in the, in the thick um, rectangles, the uh, funding, uh, the, the proportion of women doing research in different countries and in the small deep blue lines uh, is uh, the uh, research and development expenditure. And as you see, it's very, very uh, striking that in countries where we have more women in research, the funding is much lower and the opposite is also true. So that's some thought for the future, for discussion. Uh, the numbers uh, don't change too much. Uh, there are a lot of uh, women at the lower uh, levels of the um, uh, career, but as we move upwards, these uh, numbers will drop very much. The same for decision-making positions. And uh, there has been very, very little improvement since uh, 2015. And in fact, uh, only about 30% of the board members are women in research and higher education institution. And the leaders of those uh, institutions uh, who were women are below 25%. <clears throat> so the news are that there are no news. There is nothing really new to report. Uh, perhaps uh, because of that, uh, this uh, fact is moving uh, the European research area uh, towards uh, taking measure to try to change these things. And in this respect, <clears throat> the declaration is that uh, this fact, this underrepresentation of women in, in leadership position is, uh, is hindering really the growth of the European research area. And this is no surprise in an area where 40% of the uh, population thinks that we should be primarily taking care of babies and houses, uh, and men should be making money and having jobs. So uh, th there is a need for a strategy uh, at European level to tackle all these problems. So the, in this respect, in research and in higher education, we are uh, not different from other areas of, of the, of the, of the uh, European Union, no. So because of uh, all these things, for uh, Horizon Europe, there are uh, three main points to be developed, like promoting gender equality, ensuring gender, gender balance in leadership, and integrating the gender dimension uh, in research contents and programs. And um, uh, in fact, uh, the new uh, European research area uh, will be shaped uh, through 14 actions, and the action 12, uh, is the one that relates to gender equality. And uh, please take uh, note that gender equality uh, goes together with diversity and inclusiveness. It's not gender, it's more than that. And this will uh, be realized through having a gender equality plan. If you want to apply for any of the calls of the uh, European research area, uh, you have to include a gender dimension uh, by default, and it will be evaluated for excellence. And uh, increasing uh, gender equality with a target of 50% of women working in Horizon Europe uh, boards and experts groups and evaluation committees and uh, a gender balance among research teams. This will be also a criterion uh, for ranking uh, proposals with uh, similar scores. So uh, I will not stop uh, here, but 
what is understood by a, a, a gender equality plan is clearly stated. And uh, there has to be concrete measures and targets in a number of uh, issues like the ones you, you have here. And this is really uh, important. And um, I think this type of action will set the, the way to start changing things more effectively. Um, now, what about the Spain? In Spain, uh, we publish uh, something similar to she figures since 2007, which is called Cientificas and Cifras. Uh, we have other targeted statistics uh, from the ministries, and uh, we have had a feminist government, and we have now a feminist government, uh, which uh, really makes a difference. And um, what I have to tell you, I will not show you the numbers because in general, they are very similar to the uh, average uh, in the European uh, Union. Uh, similar, but not equal in all aspects. And I just want to stress something that in fact comes from she figures, uh, which is this graph, figure five from she figures, uh, where uh, the proportion of researchers working on the precarious con contracts by sex uh, is depicted. And I just took this part here where this is Spain. So we really are at here, at the very, very top of people, both men and women, working under precarious contracts. And this uh, put all the junior researchers, but particularly women, uh, under a very high vulnerability. So what, uh, what we have now, um, between our hands is an ongoing reform of the law uh, of, uh, for science, technology, and innovation, which was published in 2011, and now is being a uh, reform uh, more than 10 years later. And um, I want to show you how different laws in Spain uh, changed the things for women in science. If you look at the glass ceiling index, uh, since 2000 to 2010, there was a very marked decrease, and it was completely coincident, probably the result of all these legisl legislative actions. So we do think that laws have a very, very strong power for change. And uh, this uh, reform is uh, ongoing. And uh, I belong to the Association of uh, Women Researchers and Technologists in Spain. And we have been lobbying very strongly with the ministry to change things. And our, our position from the very beginning was to make um, that the law uh, will include positive actions for gender equality. And uh, we probably put our emphasis first in the fact that our constitution uh, mandates positive actions to, post to bridge graph to all the public powers, that uh, the positive actions are transient because they are not very well understood by the, by the citizens, by the population. And for us, it's very important that uh, we don't think, we, we know that women are not a minority uh, that need to be um, uh, taken care of, uh, you really, uh, you really uh, need to understand that point. And uh, I don't like to see that gender issues are normally mixed with other equality related issue because it's not the same. We are only asking for correcting an anomaly. And that is if we are 50% of the population, we should be 50% of the leading positions in science and uh, research and higher education. So with uh, this uh, uh, background in, in, in mind, uh, we made a series of demands. I will not go through all of them, of course. And of all these, the ones that are in red are included in the law, uh, which are, okay, they are good measures, but they are not the most uh, important for us. Uh, we want uh, to continue lobbying to achieve the, the ones in purple, which are, uh, we think they have much more uh, transformational power uh, that is facilitating and promoting quotas. 
uh, preference selection, gender budgets with measure, measurable goals in all calls of all sorts. And these gender budgets will go together with the budget reserve in all calls to launch complementary calls if the uh, gender goals are not reached in the first uh, place. No. We want that good, good practice in centers and departments uh, has economic rewards and uh, not non-compliance uh, in centers and departments will have economic penalties. And we want to uh, target uh, junior uh, researchers with specific actions. And uh, the law will be voted in the parliament uh, in the coming weeks. And what we uh, remain to, to do, and we'll be very, very um, um, vigilant to that, is to scan the development of the law, because the law is just a general uh, landscape in which uh, the royal decrees and the different calls will be shaped. And we will be there making sure that uh, at least the law is, uh, um, is um, compliant with. And uh, with that, I finish my presentation and I will be glad to uh, talk about anything you want regarding uh, this Europe or Spain uh, in this frame. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fenol. This was a very good presentation and digging a little bit deeper in the C figures. I think everybody will be pleased to have the link to the report and also showcasing how uh, different uh, levels of, uh, of uh, leadership, also the government can change things and have an impact. Yet you also showed that much more needs to be done. Uh, and that is, uh, that is very clear from your presentation. So please take part as well in the panel discussion afterwards because people will have questions uh, to you as well. We now have a very quick poll uh, to, uh, to just to break between the, the two first and two parts of the webinar today. And I invite my colleague to share the poll uh, with you here um, so that you can uh, take that if you please. So uh, there you go. How does, yeah, can you access the poll? Does that work for everyone? No, Pam, you say no? No, I couldn't. You couldn't. So I think the panelists are not allowed to take part. Okay. <laughs> but, but the participants do. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> Maybe Carmen, you can stop sharing. Oh, I'm still sharing. Yes. No, I'm not sharing. Ah, okay. There, we see your screen. Oh, is it so? Mm -hmm. I don't understand why. It doesn't show that I'm sharing. Let me see. Now I'm sharing. <laughs> I can stop it. Yes, please. So I think everybody had the opportunity to vote, but there's still some movement on the poll. And can people see the, the, um, the results? We see that we have 25% male participation in the webinar. We have 675 females, so that matches. <laughs> then uh, from which regions of the world are uh, the participants? We have um, uh, a great participation from Sub-Saharan Africa, 31%. Good participation from North America, 9% and 38% from Europe. 
um, 22% from Asia and Pacific, which is uh, really nice. And, uh, and the global participation in this webinar, I think we thank uh, all the participants for being with us today. And then the expectations, um, the, you were all asked to, to indicate uh, what your um, expectations were from, um, for, for this workshop uh, or webinar. And so the, the 71% uh, indicated that it was to increase the awareness about uh, cross-continental issues um, uh, uh, that was receiving the highest um, rate. Then there was also 46% um, indicated that uh, there, the people expect an increase in awareness about um, gender issues. Um, then 22% would like to hear um, more about recommendations for joint actions. And 27% about how to join a global working group on gender equality in higher education, which is very good because that is what we hope to also uh, trigger and organize post webinar. So we thank our SF uh, colleagues and friends now for also having facilitated this first poll. I would like without further ado to get to the next step in our uh, webinar here today and give the floor to Professor Mwenda Ntarangui, uh, who's the CEO of the Commission for University Education in Nairobi, Kenya. And you have the difficult task of leading uh, this um, very interesting panel. And I give you the floor without uh, further ado. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, from Kenya. I have the honor of uh, having four very qualified members of my panel that I will want to have them quickly give us some sense of what they want to share, especially that we have been given such a wealth of uh, background, uh, talking about um, the databases that have been used and the numbers that are coming out of IAU, the structures, the percentages. I was actually struck by how well uh, the numbers represented uh, match what we're seeing here in Kenya, where uh, out of uh, the, all the vice chancellors or rectors, equivalent of rectors, uh, we have 12% uh, who are substantive. And when you add some of them that are in acting positions, the number becomes 16%. And that says something about uh, women in higher education leadership. We also did see that there's some congruence between uh, the barriers that bring uh, low numbers of women leadership, uh, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it also seems like in, in the case uh, we've heard from uh, Ewara, similar, similar expectations of uh, women in the domestic space and men out there making money. So uh, without much more, let me ask um, our colleagues, uh, starting with uh, Professor Pam Fredman from IAU, uh, if you can share quickly, uh, what have you heard and how does it relate to your own experience and the experience of your region? Uh, can you take about th three minutes uh, to do that, Pam, please? Yeah. I don't think I need my three minutes. I had the setting the scene uh, uh, about what uh, I see from the global perspective. But uh, listening to the others, I, this, con this is confirming that we do have the same problems all over the world, although there are different backgrounds for this. And so that's what I want us to discuss and go forward. And uh, I think that uh, good examples on how to develop uh, is something we also should discuss. They might be different, but one thing we haven't talked about, and that is the international merit system of advancing in higher education that we need to, to discuss because that is difficult for most women. Thank you, Pam. I think there's something we can learn from Spain. Uh, let me ask uh, my colleague from across the border, Professor Mary Okwakol to share what she's heard and how does it relate to our own experience? She's been had uh, lots of experience across different institutions. What is your take? Three minutes, Mary. Yeah, what I've heard is that uh, the experiences across the continents 
are the same. I had the privilege of attending an Ewora meeting in Malmo University in 2019. And what I had resonated to what is what I'm familiar with in Africa. Uh, the challenges that uh, are faced in Africa when it comes to leadership and management, I mean, uh, accessing leadership and management by women uh, are, are the same as those across the world. But when we started, uh, when we uh, started the African Women, the, the Forum for African Women Vice Chancellors in 2016, at that time, uh, the percentage of female vice chancellors was about 2.67. Uh, there were at that time 1,500 1, universities and only 40 were headed by women. I'm glad that this, how, this evening I've heard that uh, that has come up to 7%. So the causes also are the same. Uh, we have causes or factors which are at personal level. For instance, in order to access a position, a leadership position, you, you must have the qualification, the qualifications, a PhD, for instance, you, you, that is very necessary. Uh, you need administrative experience. You need soft skills. All these uh, are, are very important if uh, women are to access leadership positions. There are a number of uh, constraints uh, that lead to, 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 to women having a problem. Uh, recruitment, appointment, promotions, and practices generally. Uh, hinder women from accessing leadership positions. Why? Because they are essentially competitive. And considering the background or the, the historical background of, of, of women's access to leadership positions, uh, they find it difficult to compete. So it's important that they are empowered in one way or another. Uh, at, at personal level by building their capacities, at institutional level by institutions having structures and policies that empower them to access leadership positions. Some leadership positions, uh, I didn't hear this, but I know some leadership positions uh, as a result of uh, political appointments. And that, that, that has assisted, uh, from my experience in, in my country, has assisted to get women to positions of leadership, either, either to councils, senates, or uh, vice chancellorships and other leadership positions. All right. Thank you very much. You've mentioned uh, the structures and challenges that uh, uh, women face in rising to the levels that we want them to be. Maybe follow a bit, if you can tell us some of the uh, opportunities you see to correct what Mary is talking about. Uh, any opportunities you see from the circles of your own influence and where you are uh, placed uh, as, uh, as a student leader? What are the opportunities that women can get to rise and challenge some of these realities that we're seeing uh, from our colleagues talking about right now? Yeah, as I said, in, in my country, some positions are political appointments, like uh, when a, a new university is being started, task forces are appointed. But what I've, I've seen is that uh, if women are given the opportunity to lead teams to establish universities, that exposes them. It gives them an opportunity to prove their worth. And when uh, it comes to uh, appointing substantive vice chancellors, which appointment uh, comes after an election, they are ready to compete because they have had that exposure and experience. It has happened. 
Similarly, for councils uh, in, in my country, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Education and Sports appoints, if it is a public university, appoints three members of the council. And it has so happened that some of these appointees end up uh, being chairpersons of those councils. And it has happened also with women that they have been able to access such opportunities. Uh, women can also help themselves by, net, by, by forming organizations uh, which enable them to, to network, like the VC, which I talked about, networking with the other organizations like WORA and, and others. Uh, we lack capacity of, of, of women. Uh, I mean, capacity, there is need to, what I've heard also here, the need to build the capacity of women uh, by having trainings, mentoring. Uh, mentorship is very, very important in, in ensuring that uh, uh, women have the capacity to lead because uh, many women have the what, have what it takes, but they lack the confidence and they need women who have gone through it. They need role models. They need those women that can show them the way. And it happens that most of the, I mean, many of the women that uh, have been at the top, like the ones who are, have heard speak here, have got influence. And if you're at the top of a university, certainly you have your area of influence is, is quite big. So such uh, women should take the responsibility of uh, mentoring other women. Mary, I, I, I know, let I me mean, not cut you short, but you are also a woman of influence. What have you done? in your own circles of influence to help bring in one quick way. Can you give us an example? Oh, I, I've got quite a number of examples. For instance, uh, when I was chairperson of Forum for African Women Education in Uganda, I uh, initiated the starting of a program for, for higher education because before then uh, women could access scholarships up to a six. And then after that, if they did not qualify to get a government scholarship, they would, since most of them were needy, in fact, not most of them, all of them were needy, they would not continue, they would end there. And, and some of them were bright and they were able to access higher education. So I did initiate that. And Very right good. now it has assisted th uh, th uh, th hundreds of women to access uh, higher education. I have uh, many, many examples, but I know you don't have time. That's, when I was a vice chancellor at Ubusitema, I did also uh, 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 start a system where women, uh, women who, are, uh, who, who, who are bright but needy uh, could get assisted by a waiver of, of fees and also assisted to, to get accommodation so that they are able to get education. In addition to that, I uh, started a system where admission for, 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 for students is such that we get 50-50. You know, we admit 50-50. How do we do that? Let the women compete and the men compete. And if they are qualified women to, to make the 50%, they, 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 they get 50%. I found uh, when I started with Stemma University, there was 13% uh, women uh, students, female students. Uh, as I speak now, we have 34% uh, of students. And Very finally, at, uh, at National you. Council for Higher Education, <laughs> where I am now, I've started a gender unit specifically to ensure that higher education, as, as you are aware, uh, National Council for Education is uh, responsible for uh, regulating quality of higher education in the country. And it didn't have a, a gender unit. I've uh, established a gender unit to ensure that uh, uh, the gender considerations are firmly taken into account 
across the higher education institutions. Thank you, Mary. Uh, a follow a bit, Lena. What, what are some of the ways in which you can move the agenda of getting women into leadership positions? Uh, what are some of those strategies we might want to instill as you look at your own context? Follow a bit. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'll be talking about uh, uh, changing institutional and individual mindset, which is uh, something to consider, given that uh, higher education is complex. Um, as much as um, there are biases against women swing leadership, women must break these stereotypes by experiencing or expressing their interest in some of the key leadership positions. Um, thereby reducing some of the misconception that people have about women expected to take charge of household, keep meals ready and home, or consider as emotional or uh, indecisive. Whereas studies shows that women are more likely than men to display transform transformational leadership attributes that encourage innovation and good to teamwork. So women need to post their knowledge, behavior, and attitude in the field of work and develop open-mindedness mind in changes in the workplace. They also have to achieve um, a context where they have mentors with experience and vision, whereby these mentors can understand where they are coming from understand the specific problems that they face as women at workplace, and maybe they can enable women to feel self-confidence. I will also talk about um, the masculinity nature of higher education, um, whereby we experience a lot of homosocial culture. Homo social culture is a situation where we employ our own. Male tend to employ more of uh, male and higher education than women. So women are not, uh, they are only given the lower academic levels and middle management positions. <laughs> I read somewhere when I was doing my research that um, in Ireland, women are only given top executive position in higher education if they are professors, whereas men are given top position without being professors in the same context. So I want to talk about leadership program for women who inspire to be leaders. But I feel these programs, if they are any, should focus on self-confidence, self-worth, self-esteem and capacity development. Women should be taught what confidence is and how to have it. I believe that young girls should be mentored in the area of confidence. So I want to urge the um, leaders that we have here in the panel um, or the participants that they should be able to mentor young girls who see them as leaders, especially those of, those of them who look at us like you know, role models. So because women have a lot of potential, but we are always unsure of what we can give because we seldom have confidence to speak with boldness. Thank you. All right, thank you for a little bit. Uh, Professor Inga, I want to ask you to share uh, some examples of the way we can move forward. What, are, what has worked in your own context? What needs to be enhanced? And what are some of the examples you can share? Professor Inga? Uh, thank you very much. Before going to answering uh, your question, uh, I would like also to stress about the situation and new challenges which are coming uh, in our region, uh, Central Eastern European, uh, and uh, a new challenge which, which is coming uh, from the war. And today we all ce celebrate International Women's Day, but Lithuanian and educators call this year's uh, International Women's Day 
uh, with a dedication to solidarity with Ukrainian uh, with, with Ukrainian yeah. women. Uh, we all understand that even our gender equality plans, our actions which are planned already uh, in advance uh, together with all European community will be adjusted, adjusted now as uh, our educators, our staff members, uh, which are fighting uh, uh, the pandemic outcomes now have another outcomes of uh, refugees and not only take care about their own families, uh, the upcoming educational process, the ongoing educational and research process, but also the support to uh, refugees, women and children which are coming and flowing to our country, to Romania, to uh, Poland, to Lithuania and all Baltic regions. So uh, I want to stress this important issue. And in connection with this, uh, I would also like to indicate that research indicates a clear correlation between gender equality and the maturity, maturity of the democracy. And those countries who are enjoying freedom, democracy, rule of law for uh, many of decades, uh, uh, they are on the top of gender equality list according to the global gender gap in the 2021. Meanwhile, countries who are suffering from unstable politics, uh, armed conflicts and dictatorship are at the last positions. So right here, I want to urge the academic society for, to consolidate all our resources to stand together for peace, democracy, equity, and equality. Uh, answering your question regarding concrete institutional uh, examples, uh, what has worked, uh, what has not, I can mention that we are in, as institution, we are in the process of implementation of gender equality plan of monitoring and issuing concrete measures uh, uh, for our staff members, uh, um, and um, uh, I can say that uh, now we are also in the process of uh, uh, establishing uh, establishing uh, educational possibilities uh, for uh, the kids of our staff members and also of uh, uh, our refugees who are in our dormitories. So um, uh, what have uh, worked in, in our institution? Uh, I can say that it's very specific as uh, we are specializing in social sciences and humanities. And we have uh, uh, much uh, over 50% uh, of uh, staff members also in leadership position of uh, women. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, what um, was very important uh, that uh, several years ago, we had no women in public uh, university leaders position. Now the situation completely changed in Lithuania and we have about 30% of the women rectors and the situation in the institutions are changing also immediately. As um, uh, each year we observe uh, the higher percentage uh, of women in uh, leaders' position on uh, senates, on other collegial uh, um, uh, bodies of uh, institutions. So a lot is being done, but now we are not stopping. And when we promote women's leadership in STEM disciplines, we also, as social science institution, now we promote men's, men's uh, participation in uh, social sciences, in humanities, because we have an opposite situation in social sciences and humanities. So uh, there always should be a balance uh, and uh, the concrete measures which could be uh, applied to the concrete Discipline. All right. Thank you very, very much. Uh, 
I'm afraid that uh, our time has, has run out, but uh, thank you for the contributions. We've heard that really we need to start at the lowest level in building the pipeline so that we can support uh, women to get into leadership positions, but also we need some structures that will build that kind of support through legislature, through mentoring, through giving them opportunities, uh, both financial and uh, social to move forward with it. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to take this back to our uh, moderator so that we can uh, get to the next level. I think we are going again now into uh, question and answers from the audience. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you uh, very much, Juan and, and Tarangui, for uh, facilitating this panel discussion. And we see that we need much more time. This is really the launch of a, of a global conversation on the, the topics that we have here. There is excellent work being done by ESSA, wonderful work being, being done by Evora, wonderful work being done by all of you experts in your own fields, uh, were it Carmen or Mary or Folabit or Inga at your institutions and organizations and Pam at the global level as well. So I believe that uh, what we would like to do now I saw a few questions in the in the chat, um, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ade Duntan Segun Ola Samni has asked uh, for some examples and some best frameworks for mainstreaming gender into higher education research. Um, also for some practical um, tips for indeed breaking these biases. I would believe that some of the answers to that have been um, provided by the speakers uh, in the presentations, but much more needs to be done. And I would like to invite uh, Adi Duntan Segun Olasani to also join the working group that is about to be launched. Francesco Catani uh, is here to represent the work of uh, Unibo, University of Bologna, and the lead uh, in the IEU Global Cluster on Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, Sustainable Development Goal 5, where the University of Bologna has done uh, extraordinary work uh, public publishing as well on the work of universities from around the world on SDG 5. And please read the comment in the, in the question and answer section as uh, there is more information there that we can share when we will do uh, the follow-up uh, message to everyone. André Sursoc had a very good question as well. Should we separate um, the, the fights for inequality or should the, the different fights uh, come together? There was a response if you look in the there was a response already by Carmen uh, there uh, that yes, of course, the, the different inequalities can be touched up upon um, jointly. Yet at the same time, the um, the let me read it because I'm not convinced that everybody can see that. Uh, Carmen, uh, Professor Carmen Fenol says uh, to the the question asked by André Sursoc about. Um, um, after all, women are 50% of the population. Generally, however, inclusiveness or lack thereof usually okay. embraces minorities and women, and that the actions to combat discrimination are very similar across discriminated groups. And her question was, why not then have joint actions to fight discrimination together? To which Professor Frenol said that fighting together is fine, uh, that everybody should join this fight, men included, but also different organizations and, and, um, and different stakeholders in society at large, but that each discriminated group needs different actions as it is discriminated for different reasons. And she argues that women don't fight for a small share of the space, but for 50% of it. <laughs> and so, indeed, uh, that is asking for a, a real space and not only a small um, part of, of a smaller room. Uh, and what Professor Fennell says, we are a real threat for the establishment or for the established reality of today. Um, and we will have to move considerably and not simply make us a bit of a room. The biggest discrimination, she says, in history is that against women, so gender gaps have a huge and transversal dimension. 
Um, I think you make a very strong statement there and there's not another question specifically that I see, uh, but I will go back to the space. Um, uh, that part of the, the problem, uh, so there is a question by Uche Emetoram uh, saying, I am of the view that part of the problem of women in achieving leadership are women themselves, okay, in terms of bias, inferiority, complex, pulling their fellow women down, allowing men to come between them, competing for attention from men, resulting in hate, lack of support for fellow women, women not encouraging women, women gossiping about fellow women, etc. Uh, these factors need to be addressed for a change of attitude if we must make progress. What do you think about this and what would you say? I think all these questions and comments are absolutely key and important to tackle. Um, many of them also talk to the need uh, to deconstruct stereotypical views on behaviors in general, also uh, to deconstruct um, the behaviors in general when it comes to uh, gender issues uh, and the, the, the the, there is, it's not a binary uh, dimension either, um, men, women, but it's become much more uh, rich today with many other uh, dimensions to gender that we have to take into consideration when uh, discussing these. I would like to actually maybe uh, give two minutes to, uh, to each of the organizations uh, to, to react to this, maybe Pam, uh, maybe uh, Lucy and Gulsun, but we are running out of time. And before I do so, we have a second poll that we would like to share, um, a poll that will then next to be uh, addressed by uh, Jennifer Ude, uh, once we will have given the floor to Pam Gulsun and, um, and uh, Lucy. So can you pull up the poll, uh, your colleague at the International Association of Universities, Giorgio Marinoni, uh, is going to pull up the poll. No, would you like to do that later? I see that in the chat. So I will give the floor to you then, um, Pam, please, then Gulsun, and then uh, Lucy. I think in uh, uh, two minutes, uh, I will just say that there are so many different issues that we do share all around the world. And uh, to tackle them, I think we need a focus for the further discussions on specific issues, because there's so much to learn, so much to share. And one thing, I coming back to the merit system, I think it's very, very important that uh, women gets the possibility to get the merits because the legitimacy for being a leader is also in your background and we should not have any side tracks for, for women. It's very, very important to give them the possibilities from the beginning. And uh, the third thing I would like to say is that we have to work with the mentoring. Mentoring is so important and we can share that all around the world. We don't have to be in the same country. We don't have to be in the same uh, uh, region even uh, to be mentors, to, to push women. I think uh, for a bit and uh, Dr. Fenol also made that case and, uh, and, uh, and I would agree, but cool soon. Let me give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Ilki. I think um, what have been said, uh, they are all very important, uh, you know, issues that uh, should be mentioned here in this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like just uh, to stress the issue of work-life balance. This is not widely discussed here. I think it is very important. We may have that mentoring in place. We may have laws and everything in place. But if you if we do not provide suitable conditions, which includes work-life balance issues in it, then it would not work. So uh, I have had that experience. If you allow me just Tell, uh, would like to share my own experience in my university. We provided K-12 schools in campus housing. That is very important in Istanbul, which has a 16 million population here. So when you provide all of those facilities and uh, arranging the you know, uh, lecture hours and everything accordingly, then women become become more uh, comfortable in their work. 
So that that created a lot of impact on the increasing uh, on the uh, on the increasing of uh, women professors in Istanbul Technical University during the eight years time the women professors ratio went up from 16 percent to 29 percent. Of course, setting a role model as a rector, it is another important issue. But I believe that work-life balance is a very, very important issue to be tackled for, for, this, uh, for solving this problem. Wonderful, thank you. Um, again, as I said, I will close the part for the IAU here uh, by handing over to Lucy and also going to the last part of our conversation here today and for the call to action. I think this is a beautiful start of a longer cooperation between uh, Evora, ESA, and the IAU. Thank you very much for the excellent speakers. And I know you had much more to say. We will give you that opportunity in the future. So Lucy, I turn to you for the conclusion and to uh, um, as well, Jennifer, uh, to conclude with some reflections and next actions. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I mean, thank you for everyone's um, energetic and um, uh, really focused inputs today. I think, you know, for us at ESSA, we get really excited when we, um, when the conversation turns to action and we see how all this information actually supports change and people doing things within their organizations, but also supporting other organizations um, for, for change. And what's really uplifting about this conversation is we know there are things that we can do and things that we know will make the change. So we don't just have to sit here and cross our fingers and hope that things will change. Stuff is happening um, and things are, um, we will see that impact for women. Um, do you want to go on to the next slide? Um, so just to say, sure. brilliant, thank you. Um, and so just to kind of finish by saying from Essa's perspective, um, yes, we will be wanting to dig in deeper to some of those issues raised today. Uh, there is still a need for that, more knowledge, more research. But we also want to start, um, as people are taking action, understanding what action is and how that change is happening so that we're documenting that so that we can all learn from each other um, and improve from each other so that we are um, driving the implementation. Um, of this research, working with working with our partners um, to improve not just um, improve what they do, but inspire further action um, from other people as well. So for us, this is about um, inspiring change as well. And um, thank you, everyone here today, for that very inspiring conversation. And maybe just one more point, just to say that, yeah. you know, we've started the conversation, we're listening to our stakeholders. Um, we really see this as the beginning of a further conversation around improving women in leadership. And I think what we've heard today is that the issues are, the, are common around the globe. So we've really started the conversation to share knowledge and insights that we can all build on. And um, this slide just, just shares a few insights that we have gathered at ESSA from some of the discussions that we've had with stakeholders. We've already started to talk about, dig a bit deeper into the problems, into some of the themes, but also into concept initiatives. And I think the conversations that we've had today have identified a number of other themes and concepts that we can dig into further and, and, and lead to action as well, particularly around the research assessment process, funding for research. I think these are areas that, that we haven't really covered a lot in the work that we've been doing as well. So I really wanted to take the opportunity at the end um, to capture everybody's interest in exploring joint funding opportunities and engaging in further research and topics and more specifically, what topics you would be interested in talking about further um, in partnership with, with us and IAU and Evora and wanted to just give the opportunity to put a slight a poll up for everybody to really um, capture everybody's interest. I know the panelists can't, but we but the, uh, the audience can um, really just to capture everybody's interest. That would be great. So we'll spend the last minute on this.
And I wonder, Hilliger, while, while that's going on, if you want to, um, to share the thanks, because I know we only have a minute left. I did my part there. I would like to thank you all for the wonderful uh, cooperation, but I, uh, I think I will give you uh, the famous last, last words. <laughs> sure, well, thank you on behalf of, I mean, Esther, IAU, Evora, just really thank you particularly to all the presenters and the panelists who have joined us today. Um, so Pam Friedman, um, IAU, Lucy, um, CEO Essa Golson from, from Evora as well, Krista, thank you for your support um, on the Essa side with the research. Our moderator, um, Professor Mwanda from, from Kenya as well, he did an amazing job today. Um, we had two members from um, Africa, so Professor Mary Okwako um, from the National Council of Higher Education in Uganda, thank you so much for joining us. Um, follow bit Novell. And from the Global Students Forum, thank you so much for giving us the student perspectives and Inga as well from, from Lithuania. So really, thank you for all the discussions. I think you can all see that there's so much more to, to discuss. Um, but really, I think if we can establish this global working group, we can continue the discussion. We can actually um, support each other in developing concept initiatives and, and really drive action. Um, in our individual regions, but also across the globe as well. I think there's lots of knowledge and sharing that we can we can continue to do with each other. So thanks very much, everybody, for your time and your contributions today, and happy International Women's Day. <laughs>